Hello and welcome to another special edition of our joint uh, broadcast of the podcast, The Cultural Hall and The Scriptures Are Real. I'm Kerry Mielstein, the, the host of the podcast, The Scriptures Are Real, and I'm uh, so grateful that uh, Richie Stedman has allowed us to do this for The Cultural Hall. We love the, the audience there. I'm grateful to be joined with uh, Dr. Andrew Skinner. And we're helping everyone, uh, we hope, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we hope also other Christians or people who are interested in learning about Christ and Christianity. Uh, we hope we're helping everyone to uh, celebrate and commemorate and worship and appreciate uh, the Holy Week or the Passion Week. And today it, we're talking about, because it is Holy Tuesday, uh, so why don't you uh, lead us through that a little bit, Dr. Skinner, and, and welcome and thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. It is a privilege and pleasure to be with you. Um, I guess one of the things we ought to mention is that um, the 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 four Gospels don't present um, each day in such a way as there's there's no doubt that the events happen on this particular day. What I'm driving at is that uh, the Gospel of Mark indicates that it was on this morning, this uh, Tuesday, as Jesus and his apostles are leaving Bethany and going back up over the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, that they come across the fig tree that's been cursed. And it's and it's at this point, this uh, Tuesday morning, that the apostles uh, marvel uh, again at how soon the fig tree is withered away because of Jesus' cursing it. Uh, Matthew, on the other hand, says that they're astonishment is more immediate. Just as soon as Jesus curses the fig tree, apparently it withers away. So that's a minor detail, but it helps us to appreciate that there is some fluidity in the chronologies or the harmonies, the gospel harmonies uh, that are put together, because some things we we just simply cannot know with exactness. Uh, what we do know is that uh, Tuesday is a, is a full day, is a rich day, as Jesus teaches. And as we've said before, and as he will point out to the Jewish leaders after he's arrested, he taught daily in the temple. He was with the people daily. And so other events include uh, Jesus being asked by what authority he acts. And he uh, poses a question to them and uh, says, well, if you don't know the answer to my question, then I'm not going to tell you by what authority I'm acting. In fact, they should have known by what authority he's acting. These are not stupid people that are leading Judaism. Uh, they have be, Some of them have become corrupted uh, by this time. So Jesus is still engaging uh, Jewish leadership. Uh, on this Tuesday, Jesus presents three parables, the parable of the two sons, the parable of the wicked husbandman, and the parable of the marriage feast. And in and the parable of the two sons, uh, Jesus teaches that the Lord wants repentance, not hypocrisy, which, of course, is uh, an, an emphasis of the previous day and the cursing of the fig tree. The parable of the, of the wicked husbandman, again, uh, Jewish leadership has become corrupt and repentance is needed. And then the third parable, the parable of the marriage of the king's son, um, is an important one. In fact, it's been uh, made reference to by uh, recently by uh, Elder Bednar uh, in general conference. And, and it teaches that if we're not clothed in righteousness, if we don't have the right clothing on, uh, then we can't abide the feast. And this feast, of course, is uh, referencing the great blessings that await all of those who will keep their covenants and who are thus clothed in righteousness uh, uh, symbolically as well as uh, clothed in uh, literal holy garments as a result of of being uh, in holy places in in the temples and and um, maybe I mean we don't want to spend too long but maybe I can just touch on uh, that uh, in that culture uh, being invited to a feast or eating in someone's household was a symbolic way of saying you're, you're part of my household now um, and I think that's part of what the symbolism is. If we want to be with God in his household, we have to be wrapped in robes of righteousness, which he is freely willing to give through his son. And remember that the Hebrew word for uh, that we translate as atonement is to cover. And I, yeah. I think that's the idea. Christ will cover us in his robes of righteousness. All we have to do is accept it. And, and that seems to be one of the major points of that parable. Um. 
unsurprisingly, uh, the Pharisees on this day take counsel together on how they can entrap Jesus, and they ask him several questions. Uh, they ask about paying uh, tribute to Caesar. They ask about marriage uh, and the resurrection. Uh, they ask about which is the great commandment in the law. All of this uh, is an attempt to, to try to have Jesus take a misstep or misspeak so that they can hold it against him. But uh, Jesus being the one who gave the scriptures and who is the source of uh, doctrine uh, understands what they're about. And he is, uh, he is honest, but he is also, I think, in some ways uh, clever uh, in, a, in a very good way, not, not in a bad way, in the way that he responds, because he knows that he's following a timetable and his time has not yet come. And so he, he is, um, you know, having to parry with back and forth with, uh, with those who want to destroy him. Uh, while making sure that he teaches all that needs to be taught to those who will take up uh, the, the leadership of the church, the, the responsibility that they will have. And he's, he, he does have more things to teach. Um, many of, the, uh, of those uh, who put together chronologies or gospel harmonies, as we say, uh, indicate that uh, on day three, Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse. Mm -hmm. And the Olivet Discourse, of course, named because this discourse or sermon was given on the Mount of Olives, uh, is presented in Matthew. <coughs> Excuse me, let me take a drink here. The Olivet Discourse is presented in Matthew chapter 24. And Latter-day Saints are so very blessed to have the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 24 as a separate entry in the Pearl of Great Price. And uh, more than adding to the material, I think it's the way the prophet Joseph rearranges the order of verses that helps mm -hmm. us to see the, much better the chronological flow in terms of, of the signs of the times, and how the uh, events uh, of the latter days will prepare us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And um, maybe uh, on that topic, I can just uh, remark as, in a way of providing resources for our audience. Uh, it's just occurred to me that uh, for all of Holy Week, if you want to uh, really do some deeper dives, last year on, on the podcast, really all of May and all of June were dedicated to the uh the passages in the gospels that cover uh what we cover in the holy week and so you could go and look for uh what uh, whatever day and whatever uh kind of topic you want to look at you could go back to may and june of 2023 on the scriptures are real and uh learn more about any of these topics in particular um the uh the all of it discourse uh aired on may 22nd well i think it aired on may 21st uh so you could find that one and that is also with dr skinner uh well there are two episodes and one of them is with dr skinner that is actually uh of all on on youtube not on uh like apple and other podcast platforms but on youtube that's the episode that has been the most watched uh, the closest thing to viral that we've had has been uh, that one. People seem to really, really enjoy what Dr. Skinner had to say about the Olivet Discourse. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, to to get more out of that as, as celebrating Holy Tuesday. You could go and listen to that episode. Oh, thank you. That's uh, that's helpful. I, I did. I I don't actually remember what I said as we were talking. Uh, reminds me of. Uh, Professor Hugh Nibley, some of our audience members will recognize that name. Uh, in his last years, he said, look, I can't be held responsible for <laughs> anything I said 10 minutes earlier. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm pleading uh, Hugh, Hugh Nibley there. But one of the things that I think bears uh, is worth repeating uh, is that um, President Harold B. Lee uh, gave a significant general conference talk 
in October of 1972, in which he said, if you really want to understand the second coming, there are five passages of scripture that you ought to become thoroughly familiar with. One is the Joseph Smith revision of Matthew 24, called um, uh, Joseph Smith Matthew and the Pearl of Great Prize. And then section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 101, section 133, and finally section 38. And in fact, President Lee said in this general conference talk that these five texts constitute, quote, the sure word of prophecy on which you should rely for your guide to the second coming, unquote. And so you can go back to conference report October of 1972 uh, or you can go to the Enzyme magazine, January of 73, page 106, and read President Lee's uh, sure word of prophecy on which we should base our understanding of the, of the second coming. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that what we see in Matthew uh, 24 uh, is much more chronological than the King James Version of Matthew yes. 24 or any of the others. Because basically, what what we find happening, uh, uh, the briefest synopsis is that Jesus has been teaching in the temple on this day, uh, the temple precinct, we should say. His uh, disciples finally come to understand uh, that he will come again to earth, uh, his glorious second coming, uh, and uh, after he has been glorified by the Father and crowned on the right hand of the Father. And then uh, Jesus leaves the temple. His disciples follow him. Uh, they ask a clarifying question of him before he gets, apparently, before he gets to the Mount of Olives. Tell us more about the destruction of the temple that you mentioned, uh, where you say not one stone will be left standing upon another. And then Jesus uh, uh, settles on the Mount of Olives and responds to a few more questions from the disciples. And those questions uh, then help us to appreciate sort of the chronological flow of events that lead up to the second coming. Uh, they ask uh, Jesus to tell them about the destruction of the temple and the Jews, the Jewish nation, when that will happen. And then they ask when uh, the destruction, uh, when the uh, signs of the times uh, of the second coming uh, will appear. What, what what will be the sign of your coming? That's the second question. And then the third question is, uh, tell us about the end of the world or the destruction of the wicked, which is the end of the world. And so we can look at Matthew 24 and see that Jesus answers question one in verses five through 21. He answers question two about the sign of his coming in verses, uh, the second half of verse 21 through verse 41. And then he answers the third question about the uh, destruction of the wicked in the end of the world uh, from verses 42 through the end of the chapter. And that is so helpful to, in fact, I, I can't think of a greater resource that helps us to appreciate uh, the, the chronological flow, the sequence of events uh, in their proper order than Matthew 24. And again, we praise uh, the name of the prophet Joseph Smith for uh, being this great prophet. Tuesday also uh, uh, inc includes parables of the ten virgins, um, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Yeah. And Which are so, all part of his teachings about the, the end of time, right? All so, yeah. part of his teachings. And so uh this uh, this this day three is a primarily a teaching day and it focuses on uh this his second coming and uh, and that's I think extremely helpful to the apostles who want to and need to know about the chronological sequence of events uh leading up to uh, all of us uh, having the opportunity to enter the kingdom of God. So that's uh, kind of the way day, day, day three goes, the Tuesday of the last week.
And maybe I can very briefly explain a, a, a geological thing that will help us understand this a little bit and then end with maybe some suggestions of ways to commemorate this day. But uh, this is a good day to think about that they are staying every day. They're staying in uh, Bethany with with Mary, Martha and Lazarus. So if you can picture the Mount of Olives is a very big mountain. Uh, and on the you, you go if you're coming from Jerusalem, you go towards the east and you go over the top and you come down on that eastern side. And it's just a little ways down. That's where Bethany is. So every day he climbs to the peak of the Mount of Olives and then goes down. It's very steep going down. You go down a long ways. You get to the Kidron Valley and then you go back up a, a pretty steep hill into Jerusalem. And he teaches in the temple there. He weeps over the, the, the prophecy of the destruction of the temple and so on, and then goes back into the Kidron Valley and is coming back up the Mount of Olives. This is a steep enough ascent that our 20-something students, you know, our 20-year-old, uh, you know, 21 to 25, something like that, they get winded, they get tired. They, they, that's a hard hike for them. Uh, and, and this is the hike they're doing every day as they go back and forth uh, up the, the Mount of Olives and back to Bethany. And then the next day they come back and so on. So, and it really is uphill both ways. Um, and uh, the Savior is doing this every day and his apostles, this arduous journey so that he can teach in the temple. And that's worth our thinking about how, how, how important the temple is. So again, maybe think about what the temple can do for you this week and your attendance in the temple. But I also would encourage you in my mind, uh, Matthew 25, which has those parables you mentioned, um, the, uh, the ten virgins and uh, and so on, and especially as we get to the, the sheep and the goats, that is the Savior's answer for how to prepare for the, the difficult things in uh, that precede his second coming. And so it seems to me like this might be a good day to, to read those parables and ask yourself, what can you do differently uh, to prepare for his second coming? Well, thank you. And we hope you'll join us again as we, we talk about uh, Holy Wednesday tomorrow. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, we appreciate you, Dr. Skinner. Well, thank you so much.